Hey, what's going on, guys? On this episode of Blood, Sweat, and Gear, we talk about the biggest fitness myths that you once thought were true. After that, we've got a bunch of listener questions. We talk about Phil coming back to the Olympia, uh, Skip Hill sitting on the toilet for three hours why he couldn't get off of the toilet. We've got a bunch more. We're going to do all that right here, right now on Blood, Sweat, and Gear. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Gear, part of uh, Think Big Bodybuilding Media. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, do it. Hit the like button. Hit the just to hit a bunch of buttons. That's my new thing. <laughs> just hit a bunch of buttons. Don't hit the X in the corner, though, or we'll go away. Uh, guys, you've, you're watching Blood, Sweat, and Gear. We've got a bunch of listener questions today. I'm here with Skip Hill and S2H. Between the three of us, I think we have like 100 years of training experience. Maybe not quite 100, but a lot. Maybe I just want to clarify that I'm Skip and that's that's Scott. Yes, yeah, so we got Skip Hill in the middle here. Skip's, uh, you know, I feel like so we have like 50 percent of the people who watch this show are new to the show. If they're watching the YouTube page, because I look at the statistics for anybody who doesn't know, Skip, you've coached people in the IPP, the NPC, the NFL and a bunch more. So I'm not bragging on you, man. But seriously, uh, these guys know a lot of stuff about stuff about bodybuilding and we're going to answer some questions but before we do we have a topic for you uh topic is and I, i'm interested to get your feedback guys plus i got a bunch of feedback from our listeners what is one of the biggest fitness myths that you once thought was true define fitness bodybuilding no fitness yeah. right well, same difference fitness, this is 2020 it's all fitness now. Bodybuilding is... Body, bodybuilders don't want to be lumped in with fitness. They don't want that <laughs> word. That's like a negative. That's like... Tony. Eh. It's like, I'm going to tone. Yeah, exactly. Gonna We're tone. not going to get big. We're going to tone. We're going to tone. No, nah, so bodybuilding myths. We'll say that. Biggest bodybuilding myths that you thought was true. Uh, you think about it for a minute. I want to read a couple off that we had here. Uh, um, oh, how about this one? That if you did crunches, your belly fat would go away. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. that doesn't work. Out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what? I'm sitting here trying to think of one. There's so many. Um, you know, I can even think of uh, the one that comes to mind for nutrition, or let's say for peaking for a show. Yeah. Uh, is that you can't move water without restricting or lowering sodium? I always like mm. that one. Um, but like I said, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I probably should have been better prepared, but that's yeah, a little bit of a shift. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That'll bring out detail. Oh that's yeah. Yeah. I thought you had to do it years ago. Yeah. 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 With the belly fat thing then, I mean, what are we, we're back to diet, right? For anybody who happens mm -hmm. to be watching, that's like, well, if I don't do crunches, then how am I going to get my stomach in shape? And your ab muscles can grow. Yeah. What's your bleaks and stuff. Yeah, I had this conversation with a client you know, in the gym just a couple weeks ago about abdominal training. I think the most, the large majority of people have a relatively well-developed abdominal wall. And they primarily have a relatively well-developed abdominal wall because of things like squats and, and the exercises that you, your midsection has to do to stay contracted, to hold, uh, basically stabilize the spine. Yeah. So... Um, a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of ab work in a squat or in a deadlift and, and things like that. So when it comes to direct abdominal work, it doesn't have to be heavy. Uh, in fact, I think that, and I tell a lot of people the same thing, abdominal work should be more for uh, less about increasing the musculature of the abdominal wall hmm. and more for uh, making sure that basically your your midsection is able or your core for lack of a better word is able to stabilize your spine or help to stabilize your spine during heavier compound movements if you want a good you know you want your abs to look badass then just get lean yeah the large majority i've seen people with underdeveloped abs but it's very very uncommon very i, uncommon. I was one when i like i did my first show i had really shallow abs Obviously, that's changed over the years, you know, with with just a lot more training. 
I think one of the factors for me, and I've seen it with other people. Well, a, I, I wasn't, I hadn't, I didn't have as much muscle on me. But b, um, I have a longer torso, and I, I noticed like, you know, the guys with the longer torsos, they don't have those little, those little like egg roll abs. My abs are like, you know, if you look at like Cutler's abs, he had like those big square blocks. You know, it's like they're like longer abs, and so that for me. Like my first show, man, I remember that I was like, I can't figure, like I just assumed, I trusted my coach. And we got to the point where I was like a few weeks out and I had like veins running through my core that you could hardly see my abs. I had to end up like dropping water to get like that sick chiseled ab look. So he he told me afterward he was sweating it. You what? Yeah, you should have done crunches. Yeah, well, I, I, (laughs) yeah. yeah. (laughs) I keep my ab work pretty light. I use like a... A machine in the gym, you know that the seated ab crunch machine where your feet come up as you crunch down and you mm-hmm. can put the pin in it. No. I'll end up yep. just putting. Never, like, never been in that section of the gym. No. <laughs> <laughs> never been there. I'll put like just twenty pounds on it. You know, like the first two mm-hmm. plates, and I think you know because like I, I'm with you. Don't do. I don't think you need to do heavy ab work. But then I'll just squeeze, hold. And then do that slow negative and squeeze, hold. And I can make it like a personal challenge where I'll try to get, okay, today I'm going to get 60 reps. And then a week from now, I'm going to get 70. And then when that's easy, I'll get 80. When I get to 100, I'm like, okay, that's plenty. I'll just do 100 of these, you know, a few times a week. And, you know, my abs are usually pretty good then. That's one of my favorite egg. Uh, egg. One of my favorite ab exercises is the one that you're talking the machine? And I'm very particular because I have nerve damage on that side oh, yeah. from PHN from shingles. Yeah. So sometimes what will happen is I'll do an ab exercise and I will, f- I won't feel the left side of my abdominals contracting as much as my right side. Huh. So I'm kind of careful. I have to have machines sometimes like the one you're talking about, Scott, I like the one that swivels. I don't like when the seat you can, the ones I have used, it probably, 70% of them. Yeah. They give you the option to lock oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. so the seat doesn't move yeah. or it'll swivel. Yeah. And I have to leave it to swivel because I have to pull up and focus on my left side a little bit more than my right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, did you guys see that all that gym equipment I bought? I got a bunch of stuff at the house. Now. Yeah, that's a pretty good hookup. I'm excited, man. I started personal yeah. training clients out of here too. It's been fun. Nice. It's different, did man. Remember that crappy shelf? <laughs> yeah. I broke my phone. <laughs> I put this shelf in, Skip, and, uh, and it didn't work out right. Like the whole mechanism that that mounted it to the wall was shit. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna get rid of this thing, but I'll leave it up there for now. And then, it, and it was kind of like slanted. And then, of course, an hour later, I set my phone on it. It slides off. It lands on a dumbbell. Freaking smashes my screen. Nice. So I'm screwed now. <laughs> yeah, most expensive shelf I've, shelf I've ever bought. Um, how about this one that you can force progress? Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. Mm. manipulate not force you might be able to force briefly mm. but at some point the body's like yeah i don't think so mm. it's manipulation what do you mean like Co- what coerce you you have to you have to manipulate or coerce your body to grow or get lean there really isn't much force i i i like what he's saying i think that one ranks up there probably in the top three that is good that's good beast mode 24 7 you gotta take a you gotta take a break. <laughs> yeah. That's not a myth. That's I'm sorry, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that term. Yeah, I know, right? It had slid. It started to slide into you know, into the pat and then he brings it out. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, how about this one? Uh I think somebody else mentioned this further down too. Uh Jeff Nestor, more plates, more dates. <laughs> well, that's true. That's definitely true. <laughs> if you're into dudes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because well, that's about what we get the most attention. Out well. <laughs> <laughs> you now we haven't talked about that in a long time. Is Titan known as a gay gym? Known as a gay gym? I don't know if it's known. It may be known as a gay gym in the in the. That's what I mean. Gym. Okay. Uh, I mean, see, I think what it is is I don't know that it's known as a gay gym as much as it's just very close to Wilton Manor, and Wilton Manor is um, kind of a. I don't know. It might be one of the more popular. This is the way it's told to me. People around the country in the gay community are familiar with Wilton Manor because it's 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 popular. It's like a place to be. It's like a great 
place. Uh, but what I have noticed being down here is the gay community here is different than the gay community in Denver, primarily because it, it's the majority of the gay community here is male. I mean, if I had to guess, it's probably like 70 or 80 percent male huh. versus female where I thought it was more split in Denver. Now, someone could call me out on those numbers because I, I don't know that exactly. But the point is, is the majority is male. So you just have a lot of um, the gay community here is there's a lot of money and and very successful people. And the it's also an older demographic. Hmm. Uh, than say Denver or other places that that I've been. So I don't know that it, I don't think it's known as a gay gym. I, I just think that because of its proximity to Wilton Manor and Wilton Manor being, um, you know, predominantly known as a, a gay community huh. um, or I don't want to say gay city because that's not fair, but just a high percentage, you know, the gay population is high and, and Titan is close. And, um, okay. you know, if you're if you're training people at Titan, it can be lucrative. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because fair enough. There's a, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of money. There, you know what, too? Frankly. Gay dudes in general stay in better shape. I think statistically. Oh, especially <laughs> the older, the older gay population. I at least I've noticed that down here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Much, much more vanity than I've seen. But you know what? I, look, the gay population, and I know these are stereotypical things, so somebody could you know bash right. me on this, but they tend to. Tend to be better looking dudes than us, us straight motherfuckers. They dress better, and so I mean, you you, you just you, there's probably more money. There may be more money in the gay population than I'm even giving them credit for. Well, I don't know. They also haven't I mean, gotten beaten down by kids for the last twenty years either. So there's that, you know. What do you mean? I don't like they don't, haven't had to raise children and pay for school. And, oh, yeah. You know, they they spend the money on themselves, take care of themselves. You know, pay attention sure. to fashion and you know. That kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. That's why I can, I'm single. I can, I can put my gym together because I don't have a bunch of kids that I have to support. So, right. uh, and I'll also die alone. So there's that. No, actually I've got Victoria. As long as the border opens, I will not die alone. Titan, Titan Jim's website says home of Skip Hill. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. should. Mm -hmm. Is he wearing like a <laughs> rainbow shirt in that picture? So they not meeting him in the locker room, but I don't know what that's about. <laughs> All right. Uh, that you had to cycle creatine or risk kidney damage. Yeah. Yeah. With the higher, cause it kicks out that. higher creatinine levels. But I, I know I used to remember when the, you know, the doctors 10, 15, probably 15 years ago would uh, go crazy with your creatinine levels and say that your, you know, your kidneys are going to fail and, and everything else. But I still think creatine's overrated, but that's a different discussion in and, in and of itself. I don't think I have any of my clients using creatine unless they're using it and not telling me. Hmm. <laughs> I think your clients could all be doing 5% better than Skip. Yeah, they Maybe yeah. they could. <laughs> they could be benching 10 more pounds than they're, than they're benching right now. Yes. 0.05% progress is missing, Skip. That's right. I feel like everybody almost nowadays is Almost like everybody takes pre workout, I think, nowadays. We'll say, I don't. Well, you don't know, but you're, you're in a not, you also don't take creatine, but normal people, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it feels like everybody uses a pre workout. Like for some people, since they started training, they haven't been around since like, like pre workout has been around since they've started training. You know, it's like it's a household thing for, for weightlifting. And I think not all of them, but a lot of them have creatine in it. So I feel like people are inadvertently taking it a lot more often than they're purposely taking it anymore. Leaving well, energy drinks have them. Like bangs and stuff. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, let's see. So uh, what's another one here? Oh, Matt Marshall chimed in on the live feed. He says uh, that uh, pros are always shredded year round. Uh, like they, they always look like they do in the magazines. That's a good one, too, because when I was trying to think of something off the top of my head, I'm thinking the biggest myth that I had when I was younger was exactly that, because all mm. we had, and I know Matt's older, too. He's not as old as I am, I don't think, but <laughs> he's older, too. So, you know, back when the magazines were out, that's the only information we had, and they were always shredded. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I did it when I was a teenager. I would always have to stay so lean. And, so, and I remember finding out 10 years later, I'm like, oh, shit, maybe I should have been growing during that time and this is why i didn't grow a whole lot when i was in my teens mm, yeah Ooh, this one's kind of sad that training your calves will make them grow 
<laughs> that's that's pretty good. That's a good one. <laughs> what have you found working for for Cavs? I I can't tell you because mine have been good. I can tell you what John Meadows told me or told the world. When I say me, I mean I saw it on a video. But what, what have you found to be helpful for you and your clients, Skip? Well, I was born with pretty much no calves. Okay. And by the time I got here's another myth. Just so I want to piggyback off of what he said that calves actually matter in competition. Mm. They used to matter. Yeah. You could not ask Tony Pearson. He could not. He had a pretty good physique back then, but he didn't have good enough calves, and he would lose shows and be placed lower because his calves were so bad. That does not happen anymore. Mm. So I laugh and say, by the time I got good calves around the mid-'90s, they didn't matter anymore. Um, so I had to take shitty calves and make them grow, so I do know how to make them grow. Yeah. And I think the, the number one thing that I could tell people – if I had to say, oh, it's one thing that you, you know, you would say is the most important thing when training calves to get them to grow is don't count reps. Just literally tolerate as much discomfort as you can possibly tolerate. Huh. Yeah, yeah. And full stretch, full squeeze, because the mid range your body is used to from walking around all day. The other option option is just to get fat as hell for like ten years. Yeah, because fat. People who are fat for a long time, they always have incredible calves from moving that weight around for the last ten or twenty years. So you got options. You don't there's no yeah. like there's no one way. You can you can right. pick calf implants. There you go. And the latter might be actually more fun because then you know you if anybody calls you out for your weight or your diet, you can be like, bro, I'm just getting my calves to grow. And then you bang a calf shot right there. Bam. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody has the McNally calves though. I mean, I, we already got the calves. On a, on a, on a snowy mountain, you can't get out. We got to eat somebody. We're gonna eat McNally. We're gonna have yeah. his calves. Sorry, like fillets. Yeah. It's like, well, looks like Scott's dying. So where do we start? I'm starting. Get calf. the fillets. So I will say, so calves may not win, might not lose shows if you have bad ones. But if you have do, if you do have good ones, I feel like it's a plus. You know what I mean? Like the you yeah, you, you do look more complete. You know what yeah. I mean? When's the last time you heard somebody say, "Look at those calves." Every time I've been on stage. I get that all the time. I got it going into the fucking uh, post office the other day. Did you really? The post office is not a show. I'm talking about a show. When did you look at the show and go, look at those calves? Yeah. And that's that's a good point. I agree with that. Mm. But I do think that calves are going to I know I've, I've had numerous compliments people who will say something. Now, it's usually the leaner I get. But I'm sure yeah. you got the same thing, Scott. People will be like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's For me, it's not even something I'm like like – like, thank you, because it's like I, I really, you know, they just grow as I train my legs. Now, if you said that about my shoulders, because I didn't have shoulders at all before I started training, then I'd be like, thank you. And I'd feel really good about, yeah, man, I got, you know, the guy noticed my shoulders. You know, it, of course, it'd be a guy, by the way. You know? Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Women don't give a shit. Yeah, That's a sad shoulders. Oh, thanks, guy. I we have freaky that. calves. If someone's going to say something about yours because they're freaky. Yeah. They're big. Yeah. Um. What else do we have here? We had we had a bunch more of these things. I got to scroll down a little bit. Uh, David Smith, he said, uh, oh, and because you got to understand too, Dave Smith is. I don't know what it is. Is it a purple belt? Is that the best you can do in jujitsu? Black belt. I don't know, but he's a bona fide badass. I know. So is it black belt? Because I thought it was different in There's jiu-jitsu. degrees of black belts too. Okay. Well, he's got like the high one, whatever that is, and I know he just right, earned that too. And the dude is like, he's two fifty lean like like contest lean big dude anyway he says uh that the more uh the more mass is directly associated with a lack of flexibility and mobility uh reduces positive influence on one another that's so true that's the i've i've heard that before like why would you want to get that big you'd be all muscle bound you couldn't do anything you can't know? wipe your ass yeah 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 yeah, I'm not. I'm like, dude, I'm not Kovacs. Like, I'm pretty sure Greg could wipe his ass. He just lazy and he just didn't want to. <laughs> so he call his wife in. Call his girl in there. Come on, change my it's diaper. Like, have some dignity, dude. Wipe your own ass. One time I was caught on the toilet with a back spasm when I was having lower back problems. Yeah. I was on the toilet for three and a half hours, but I, I had taken a shit for lack of a better. I tried up? to think. I know. I tried to think of how I could phrase that a little softer, but. There's would, no way. Took a shit. Yeah, yeah, there's so, no way to phrase that half, softer. I know, right? Three and a half hours. How'd I'm you get up? Like, well, motherfucker, shut up so I can finish and I'll tell you. Fall off. <laughs> We're interrupting me. <laughs> I got a story going. No, what I did was I, I sat back because my, my lower back was so tight. You know, like when you get up in the morning, 
if he has something like a lower back injury, that's when you're the most stiff and it's hard, you know, to sit down or stand up, that sort of thing. So anyway, because I'm an old man, when I get up within like three minutes, I'm going to shit my pants. Like I can't even smell coffee and I'll be like run into the fucking bathroom or, you know, put nicotine in or run to the bathroom. Anyway, so I sit down and I think I decide that it's a smart idea to lean back. So I lean back, but oh. I go to sit up and I'm like being electrocuted. Like I, oh God. Like my lower back's like, Ugh. So I'm like, oh my God, fuck my life. So when it starts to spasm, then of course it gets tired, tired. I can't move. I'm there for three and a half hours. The only re the only way I got up was I took three Percocets and waited because I couldn't just get How'd you up get the Percocets? Did you just have them on the toilet seat to take? Yeah. What's that? How'd you? Yeah, Bridget, how'd you get like the Percocets? Percocets on the toilet seat? I had my wife bring them to me. But here's the thing. I just got to a point where I'm like, I got to do something. So, and, you know, you, you, I'm thinking all these things like I'll just slide off the toilet and onto the floor and it's going to be painful. And then I'm like, and I took a shit. I, I, there'll be fucking doo doo everywhere. So my wife says to me, this is why I'm coming back to the Greg Kovacs. She's like, you know that I'll help you out. Aww. I'll help. And I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, it, in my brain, I'm thinking, oh, you're so sweet because there's no fucking way I would do that for you. Like, if it was you, you would just have to sit there in your own dookie because there's no way I'm wiping your ass until you're like 80 years old. So I'm thinking. And by then you'll be no... dead. So you're out. You got an out, you know. <laughs> I'm definitely going to die first. There's no <laughs> question. So, yeah, so I'm out of that. But I'm thinking to myself, I have, I'm sorry. I know this is really bad, but I'd rather sit here with my dignity than to have my wife wipe my ass from me. So that's when it comes back to Greg, Greg. And I'm just thinking, you can't be that big. You can't be that big that you can't wipe your own ass. Yeah, yeah. That's just lazy. I heard stories that he would get in the shower and they had like a hose attachment and she'd hose them hose them off after. I mean, you would be clean that way. You'd be super clean, right? I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Don't. That's another topic too, bidets. And so you still have to wipe your ass with something. Yeah. You ever taking a shit that's like a jar of peanut butter? That's not coming off with water. You got to eat more fiber if that's the case, though. You know? I'm just saying. I don't know, man. Sometimes I don't know if that water would work. But anyway. Do we have any, do we have any viewers left now? No, probably not. No. And we can't monetize this, so we're really screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, that it's all just drugs and that the pros were uh, taking more gear. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one's a given. I think at the same time, though, there is something to be said that the guys who have been around longer and are bigger, I think as a rule, do tend to take more gear. But that kind of sets up the misconception that, you know, well, if I take more gear, I'll just I'll get huger. So, yeah, that that part, I, I definitely agree with. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Arnold's routine from his book was the be all end all way to train. Ooh, shout out to Jesse for that one. Yeah, it was at that time though. <laughs> I use Lou Ferrigno. Lou Ferrigno, how did Lou train that was so different? I don't know, I don't remember. You he just, put more weight on because it, it was all, it was all kind of. I mean, he lifted a little bit heavier, but he used to eat rice and pour salt all over it. So I used to eat rice and pour salt all over it. Okay, okay. Where so, did you hear that? Um, it's on a video with him and Arnold when they made Pump and Iron. I have seen Pump and Iron probably 250 well, times. Get off the toilet and go watch it again. What, he, now, he has on. this big bowl of rice. It's like this big. They're both sitting at a table, and he's dumping salt. Okay, okay, salt okay. okay. Right, okay. So if that's the case, then that's cool. But what I'm saying is he never said that. You just saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I don't know. If okay. I believe more than I see than I hear. No, no, no. What, my point is this. I, I never have heard... Well, not never have heard anything. I haven't heard much over the years, even back when I was a teenager. And I started in 84 and I would read every word that I could find. There was hardly any information that I was aware of about Lou's training or his hmm. diet or anything. That's a good point. I, it was very, very limited. That's why I didn't know where you, know, you got Some of us are a little more privileged. Hold on a second. Yeah, Lou. <laughs> That's yeah. yeah, let's skip. Could yeah, have been sugar yeah. out. Oh, I'll take care of it. Bye. Sorry about that. I had to get the phone call. Mike Menser. He had he had a he had a uh, in uh, Weeders magazine one time. He had a his workout, and I copied it. I had it on the wall. Okay. What about? And I felt bad using the Arnold arm blaster to the Lou workout. After that, well, yeah, that's. I don't blame you. That's definitely. I, think I was like fifteen or something. Mike Mike Menser. He had a very different routine than Arnold, and he was not like. 
that was not very like widely accepted because he no. basically told the world that you don't have to do like double like Arnold was the one is because of him that people were doing like two a day training and people were training for four hours at a time and he could get away with that. You know, there's guys with great genetics. I keep going back to Brandon Curry because when we talked to him, Scott Stevenson and I, we talked to him about his training. He was like, I was like, what was the big difference? What did you change that, that really was such a difference maker? And he said, like being an analytical guy, he was like, I really had been careful with my training and I didn't want to overtrain and I didn't, you know, I wanted to give myself the recovery. He was like, and then what did he learn from like going to oxygen? He learned that those things don't apply to him, that he can push hard. He can do like an Arnold train. He could probably do like follow four hour Arnold workouts and he would just get better. Most of us, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way, you know? I think the large majority of people, though, when when you're talking about Menser back then, yeah, they probably couldn't relate. I mean, think about that. You're you're not on the level that Arnold is at that time, popularity and just his position in in the sport at that time. So people are going to look at what you're doing, and it's completely out there. Yeah, yeah. But yet it probably applied, and there would have been better results for. 70% of the people reading those magazines yeah. than it would have been to do what Arnold was doing when he was such a gifted. See, I see Arnold is, is far superior, far superiorly gifted right. than, Men, than Metzer. Menser. So I think had Menser come along later and his popularity was in, say, you know, the 90s, yeah, that would have been a showstopper. You know, it, and I know that this is kind of a little bit of a tan tangent a little bit, but I wonder, because I don't know the details of, you know, suicide and everything else, but I wonder, you have to wonder what played into that or, or if bodybuilding played into that and the fact that, you know, he was onto something he was providing all this information. Obviously, he didn't kill himself because no one would listen to his thing because a lot of people followed that type of program and, yeah. and, you know, made good progress from it. But, you know, he may have been so convinced that he was onto something, was providing information that could have played into you know, some si some sort of, you know, issues that he had longer term. I don't know. I just wonder about that. Do you don't know anything about his suicide? I do like a that? little. I mean, I don't I actually I'm I'm supposed to talk to a guy who's good friends, who was good friends with him, like a, one of his best buddies. You should get him on the show. I'm planning to. Well, here's the deal, yeah. though. He's an old school dude. I uh, I tried to reach out to him. He gave me his phone number. I texted him. He never got the text. Why? Because it was a landline. Okay. Yeah, he's got a landline. That's what That's, I was going to say. His phone has a cord on it. And I explained to him about Skype, and he was like, oh, I don't have any of that stuff. I just have a phone. So if I talk to him, it's got to be an audio-only podcast. i got to figure that out. But here's the okay. deal. Now, I, I haven't talked to him yet, but from a little bit of the research I've done, so Mike Menser did have schizophrenia, and it was progressive. Oh. So by the end, I guess that he was out there. Uh, you okay. know, He had a lot of mental issues. And I think, too, that it, now what I learned from Scott Stevenson is that his training evolved, too. So what heavy duty was at the beginning was very different than what heavy duty was at the end of his life. By the end, he was like, you only need to train once a month. Like it was so far out there that, you know, it just it, it, it didn't make sense to a lot of even further. You know, it, it didn't make sense to people. So right. I think that that's kind of part of the confusion as well. But, yeah, he had some mental stuff going on. So I'm sure that I'm sure that like being kind of on the outside didn't help either, though. You know, let me let me just add this little part before we move on. I think that if people could take the step of spreading out their training and training once every couple of weeks or something like that, I think that there might be far more to that than than what that huh. idea gets credit for. And the reason I say that is I just backed it up the other day when I was out for like two weeks and yeah, I deflate very, very quickly. I mean, it's like pulling, it's like taking the air out of a tire or a balloon and it just looks nothing yeah. of what it did. But then within a week, I just blow back up my joints feel incredible the pumps are insane and i i look at it myself going damn i don't know that i didn't look or don't look just as good as i did before i took this break after only coming back for a week and i've done this over the years yeah. when i've been forced to take breaks and it's crazy how fast i can come back and i always think to myself man my joints feel so good the pumps are so good my strength is still there 
I wonder if there's something to this. And then I do what everybody else does. There is no fucking way I'm only going to train every other week. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. But it has crossed my mind because I thought, man, you know, your joints would take less of a beating. The recovery would be through the roof. Yeah. But, well, eh, well it, can't do it. I've been trying this once a year training and it doesn't work. So. No. Yeah, I was going to say, there, there comes a point where working. the gap is just too big. Yeah, it's not working. <laughs> I watched the John Meadows video today. I can't remember which one it was, guys, but he made a cool point. He said, it's very, he was like, I don't think I've ever seen anyone that under trains people that are in bodybuilding. He's like, I see a lot of overtraining, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone that under trains. Just, right. But then uh, you, you know, have those times where you don't train hard enough and you don't grow. And then you train harder and you do add intensity techniques and you start progressing. So it's kind of a tough, it's a tough call. It's a, and, and really, as far as your psyche is concerned, do you want to leave the gym wondering if you did enough? Or yeah. do you want to leave the gym knowing you left it all there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a tough one. Dude. Yeah. I mean, it... I, I know a guy that I know a guy that trained like three days a week and when he was in the gym, he'd literally like sit on the, on the, uh, uh, like the Nautilus machine to do cur you know, preacher curls with like 40 pounds. And they're going talking to you while he's just doing these little slow, slow curls Nothing to do that a phenomenal physique. It was unreal. He won he won uh, the state championship. He's a light heavyweight then. I mean the dude just looked phenomenal and he didn't do shit, man. He he didn't hardly do any he didn't hardly do any free weights. He'd like sit on cable crossovers and just go like this real slow with next to no weight and talk to you. Huh. Uh -huh. yeah, took a lot of your, drugs. He took a lot of drugs, I can tell you that. Well, exactly. <laughs> and genetic predisposition too, yeah, because I know that phenomenal. I've seen that. The, yeah, I think we've all seen this. The guys who have genetic superiority, you know, can train far less intense and grow like crazy. Um, it's no secret to anybody, uh, and I'm not asking Dylan to admit it because that's up to him, but Dylan knows how Phil trained in the early years. Yeah. And it wasn't exactly hard. The, the, the joke was the intensity would go up when the camera came on. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, he did. He didn't pull deads. He didn't do heavy compound, you know, movements like squats and things like that. And the guy just, you know, he grew like crazy. He did a lot of machines. He did a lot of lower intensity stuff that you just went, oh my god! Like he, it, which is not to, you know, I'm I'm not trying to take a shot at the guy or anything else. All I'm saying is, after years start going by, he started training harder. Hmm. But early on, he wasn't training all that hard. Yeah, I could see that. I remember, uh, and, and I think that's across the board too. I think a lot of people, a lot of people already kind of have that that idea about Phil that you know he is the gift that he's not the. But then at the same time, though, yeah, he. I've also heard that he's done like a ton of weight on squats for for high reps. Oh, his strength. Yeah, there's no question. His his strength is there. I mean, that, you know, the old story was that Jay Cutler pulled him aside. You know, we talked about this a couple times and just told him, well, "What are you? You're asking." For trouble i'm paraphrasing but you're asking for trouble you don't need to move 150s and 160s mm, you want to yeah. stay in this game for a long time you need to back off huh. yeah which which makes sense for him versus like go back to a menser menser couldn't do you know what what a guy like arnold did but it does it is more risk than to take it to a higher intensity so someone else may not have been able to do the same thing as phil you know so they have to push harder take basically yeah take more risk the more the less you're predisposed to be good at it, the more you have to take risk to be good at it, you know? Now, you said intensity. I'm going to disagree with that. I don't think intensity. I just wrote an article about this a couple of weeks ago. It'll come out on uh, Elite FTS here in another week or so. I don't think intensity puts the body in a vulnerable position for injury. I think that heavy weight and poor form do. The thing with intensity is, is where you run into problems is if you get or take a set to the point where form does falter and the or the weight is too heavy, then you can get injured. But I don't think in, intensity in and of itself is is really all that well that dangerous. To open you up for and I don't know that you meant. I don't know that you were specifically yeah, saying that. Yeah, I guess I'll put it this way. And I don't know if intensity. If if I were to step back, I'm you know just in conversation here. But when I like when I say intensity, I'm thinking. Uh, the like in Menser's term, high intensity training. So you're going to do instead of doing 20 sets, you're going to do just one. But that one set has to be the best set you've ever done in your entire life. Every time you do it, you know, you, OK, I, so that that intensity, then 
you're in, and I'm, I'm asking, I'm, yeah. I guess, but that intensity or, or going to failure, because that's where I say, I don't think failure or going to failure or even beyond failure puts the body in a more vulnerable position than heavy weights do. I think that huh. the heavy weights, to me, that's the most vulnerable position, like a weight that your body can't handle and i understand progressive overload yeah everybody wants that because that's the you know everybody has that at, at the as the top um choice for growth and i like to say that i think is intensity is more important obviously you still have to train relatively heavy that's all right i'm not saying intensity with you know 25 reps not going to failure with a 25 pound dumbbell is going to produce you know more growth and progressive overload i'm not saying that but what i am saying is i think that intensity trumps progressive overload heavy weights see i guess it's a i think we're talking about a we're defining the word differently i think so and you intensity know? a lot of times i think with with a lot of people uh, and i would ask scott this you know you tend to kind of put everything under that un intensity umbrella it's a heavy weight it's getting everything you can yeah and yeah. sometimes when you're trying to get another rep people will say well you can't keep form perfect yeah you can you can you can keep it damn near yeah you know, i tell this to my clients all the time one-on-one -on -one. the first rep should look like the last rep yeah. the only difference would be you fail and if it's progressive overload you should be able to get that. Like if you could get 10 reps before and now you're trying to get 11, that's 11 reps with that same form that you got 10. It's not like now you're going to cheat it so that you can get it. Or a faster rep speed or any or a shorter. Yeah, right. Uh, instead of going full lockout, full stretch, full lockout, all of a sudden they're three quarter reps, things like that. Yeah. 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 Well, if you train to failure, okay, it's relevant to how much weight you're using it that your structure can handle because – Let's say, I'm gonna give you an example. Say I take 30 pound dumbbells and flat press them to failure. Okay, that's still once my muscles are failing, my structure only has to handle 30 pounds in each hand. But if I do that with, let's say 60s, and I go to failure, then that's where form, cheating on your form is a problem because then you're structurally using your, your joints, tendons, and your your, 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 your non-muscle structure to move the weight. But, but where can, does the injury happen? Well, I think it's, I think it depends on the weight. Okay. Let's say, so I can think doing one twenties and incline dumbbell presses for like 10, 12 reps. Okay. Taking those to failure has a potential for more injury than taking sixties to failure. The sheer force of the, of the amount of weight. Yeah. I feel like for me, mm -hmm. I've been trying to do be progressive with that movement incline press and yeah, just the sheer force of holding 110, 120 pound dumbbell is a lot greater on I'm I'm more concerned that is my fiber are but the fibers just going to start tearing apart on me than if I had a 50 yeah. in my hand you know because both times I tore my uh, shoulder up was on incline dumbbell presses and one time was the 120s and the other time was the 110s Ooh. did it happen on the concentric or eccentric part of the well the first time was the 120s I was done I had them back down here and I was going to bring them down to my knees and this left one slipped off to the side and I didn't let go of it fast enough. The second time was just to fail your pressing. So you're right, but was it on the negative? But was it was coming out, coming out, or right? But I already, had, but I'd already, I'd already compromised his shoulder before. So, you know, I mean, was that a problem? And I broke this collarbone in between those two times, so I had some issues. So that you know, right. structurally, I couldn't handle it. I'm trying to get to the point where I feel that the large majority of the injuries happen on the negative part of a movement. And that's, again, coming back to the heavier weights being the issue. Uh, I mean, ben, I mean, the most pec tears I've seen bench pressing have come, uh, you know, out of the hole. Well, when the, when the muscles in the stretch position, the most fibers are firing. So, I mean, that makes sense. What I would question, that's why I just asked you, if you were in the hole and you were ready to come out, or you were actually coming out of the hole. I'm not saying that they can't happen. All I'm saying is the majority of them tend to happen on the negative. But and, it, I mean, you got a point because if you're a competitive bench presser, the negative part has more t time on tension on your pecs. Exactly. It's exactly. slower. Yeah. And that's so. where I think when you get into the heavy weights, those injuries happen there for I just I just stand by the fact that I feel 
uh, my own opinion is from what I've seen over the years is that the large majority of, um, you know, the injuries come from the heavy weights or the weight being too heavy versus flat out intensity. If all things are equal with form, rep tempo, things like that. Yeah. Mechanics are huge. I mean, it comes back to mechanics. Like, you know, we always talk about because yeah, the more weight you got, the more per- the more stressors on your structure and everything else. We literally got so much feedback on this post. Like there are so many body I was going to say fitness myths out there. There are so <laughs> many bodybuilding myths out there that we all believed. Uh Jeremy Jason had one too that was really good. He said that you had to run or jog to get shredded. It yeah. works. <laughs> it may. It may. I don't know. Long distance runners aren't always <laughs> terribly lean. <laughs> But yeah. very catabolic. They don't have the my, biggest my physique. My old coach either. used to make the, the, the female competitors, if they were kind of, their butt was a little bit big, you know, hips, make them run and get take it off. Yeah, but I don't know how many. The only pro bodybuilder that I've seen running was when I watched the original Generation Iron movie when they had Phil Heath, like, literally running. He was jogging. and it was, was just running up the canyon. Yeah, yeah, and it was just for the movie. From what I understand, uh-huh. he didn't really do that. So Yeah, Rich Gaspari did something too lazy similar. To did he? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it, what you have, too, is, I mean, it's, it's not a great idea when you're having high impact. You know, you got a body weight that's higher than most people, yeah. and you're doing a high impact. I mean, your knees and lower back take a beating with something like that. You don't want to <laughs> – you're taking years off of your training if you're – uh, your leg training, I think, if you're uh, running at all. Holy shit. Yeah. Your uh, your body can't process uh, two scoops of protein at once. It's a waste. That's a good one. Yeah, more than 25 grams of protein per meal. Every now and then I'll still get a client who will ask me about that. And I'm not knocking it. All I'm saying is it's such a long-standing myth that it is still there. So, it's like, you, you, get a, you write a new plan, you send it over, and they're like, whoa, whoa hold on a minute, Skip. Wait. You want me to do how many scoops of protein in that meal? Right. That's yeah. Well, and, and I have a different approach with my clients. I always tell them, you know, because sometimes people won't, and I'm sure you guys get this too with clients. They feel like their questions are dumb or they're so rudimentary that, you know, they're, they're irritating to you and they don't want to do that. But I try to encourage my clients not only to ask all the questions they want to, but uh, I get on other trainers for not being, I tell my clients this all the time, if your trainer, you know, if you go, you're working with someone else, or you work with someone else in the past, or you work with someone else after me, if they don't answer your questions, one of two things is going on. They either don't know the answer to the fucking mm-hmm. question, which is, it happens a lot, or two, they're protecting what they feel are their secrets, mm. which is bullshit, because if they're your client, they're paying you not just for the results. That might be the top tier, uh, you know, like the end game. But they're paying you also for your knowledge and your experience. Your secrets. And if you're not giving, yeah, if you're not giving them your secrets, and there are no fucking secrets. <laughs> there are things other people don't know, but that doesn't make that a secret. Yeah. If you're guarding your information, good luck keeping a de- decent client base or getting a decent uh, training fee or uh, whether it be personal training or online training. That's just from a business standpoint, that's just bad, bad business acumen in my opinion. Yeah. Hey, I think this two scopes of protein thing started way back when protein powder was like drinking sludge, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like way back when it first came out and it was just like the worst shit you ever put in your mouth. Yeah. From I think a- that's when that started. And it mixed like flour. It was like mixing the yeah. lit protein was like putting flour in water. Well, it was in a coffee can. Basically, yeah. you had to open it with a can opener. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, it's it was nowhere legit. near as good as Skip Blend from Lead FTS. Exactly. Well, from True Nutrition. But... There you go. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Yeah. But a lot of good shit from Elite FTS, too. But. <laughs> so, what do you guys think? We had a couple of listener questions. We could either go to those, or we could go. We could continue on with this because there's there's a bunch more stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it up to, to you guys. Questions. You go to listener questions. Skip, what do you think? This is a sure. democracy. Uh, is it? Because if I want something, typically I get my way, and then Scott pouts over there in the corner. <laughs> just, just mute him. Can you mute him? <laughs> All right. In that case, we're going to do what Scott says. Let's go to some listener questions. A bold and battle-ready focus formula that takes no prisoners and shows no mercy. Um, for starters... Uh, if you guys want to chime in, by the way, feel free to throw some listener, more listener questions in. We're running a little long here, but we'll try to squeeze them in. 
A local guy won the Tampa Pro Open. Local guy? Yeah, Hunter Labrada. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Oh, yeah, that's right. He's down there by you, huh? He used to work out with his uncle. You did? Yeah. Huh. So his uncle. right near me. Wait a second. His uncle. Was his uncle brothers to Lee? It was uh, the other side of brother. Lee's brother. You worked out with Lee Labrada's brother? Yeah, we went to the same gym. Just knew each other. What's his name? I wouldn't say we like hung out and worked every workout. But, you know, we'd work in together, talk, all that stuff. Okay. What's his name? Spot. Gene. Was he in good he's shape? A trainer. He's a trainer down here. Yeah. Does he have like Hunter Labrada genetics? No, he's, he can, he competed. He's, he's, he's tall. He's a, he's taller than Lee. Well, Hunter's taller than Lee too, but uh, Gene's probably like 5'10", 5'9". I'm kidding. I huh. think everybody is taller than Lee. Oh. No, no he was, he was a lot, but he was, he's a pretty good sized guy. I mean, I'd say he's probably bigger than Lee overall, yeah. just structurally too. Lee turned pro as a middleweight, right? Did he? Me, yeah, he, he was, was a he was, he was a smaller guy. I wanted to say like 185. I mean, Hunter miles. used to train in that same gym. I saw him. This is not recently, probably a couple of years ago. Yeah, right. and he runs, he jogs. All right, I'm gonna jump into that first question then. Uh, I see some coaches being good buddies with their clients, while others are all business. What's your take, Scott? You want to start this one out? I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this from my wife who's a trainer full okay. time okay. Been one for longer than skip has oh wow yeah. and um yeah right sure i think there comes a point and i know this is it, your trainer is not your life coach slash somebody you have to tell them constantly text them i mean it's okay i mean but it's it's i would say that sometimes it's over the top you know like every problem everything every you know I'm going to go buy something or, you know, it's just like, I think there comes a point where you got to draw the line, you Hmm. know, that, uh, you know, especially if if some, if a coach gives you their cell phone number or text number, yeah, if it's important to the plan or something's going on or you need to, you're going to attack, something comes up. Yeah. But I mean, you know, when you get all, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm friends with people I've worked with over the years, but that's different. We're not working with each other anymore. You know, there comes a point where they're not your, your sounding board for every problem in your life Hmm. for everything that goes on daily. They're not your social media account. Hmm. Yeah. That's just my, that's just my opinion. Skip. What about you? What do you think? Yeah. Scott's wrong. Yeah. No, (laughs) uh, well, it's poor boundaries really. And uh, as a trainer, you can do it any way you want. So I'll say that first. Um, I do have clients that I have a good rapport with those that I have, trained for longer periods of time. When I say longer periods of time, you know, sometimes three, four, five years. I think that's a little bit different situation than a typical client. Uh, But I would say for the large majority of clients, I think from a business standpoint, if you have poor boundaries, you're asking for trouble. Hmm. Uh, And by that, I mean, you kind of have to keep in perspective, you know, they're paying you. And, and I guess the best way to explain it is you want them to continue to pay you. You want from a business standpoint, that's your end game. You want to keep your clients and retain your clients yeah. versus having more client, um, uh, rollover or turnover. And I think when you, if you have poor boundaries and you, you hang out with your clients, you're giving them another reason to it's seriously to drive them crazy, just like them driving you crazy. Um, and I think that's where the, the boundaries come in. They don't want to hear your personal crap and you have to be careful because as a trainer, I don't know that you need to be a life coach, but I think that as you do build a rapport or a, or a relationship with a client, there are going to be things that you may want to know that they're struggling with or dealing with. As an example, if they're struggling with their diet and they're not telling you that they're going through a, you know, a divorce or a breakup or something like that, or a sickness in the family, um, you know, information like that, I think can, can be valuable. If they're struggling to stay on track I think things that will play into their results, that's important. But I just think that, you know, hanging out with, um, you know, clients are running around or, or, or spending time on a yacht or something like that, uh, as an example, is you, I think you run the risk of getting on each other's nerves. And 
you may not have your client get on your nerves, but who knows? You might get on theirs. <laughs> and from a business standpoint, really, it, it, from a business, especially in this day and age, when you got everything from politics to social issues and everything else, oh, if yeah. you get into a conversation with a client about something like that, you're just dumb. You just don't mix your personal opinions and viewpoints with business or you're going to basically lose business at some point. You may not with this client, but you could with the next client. So you got to kind of keep your, you got to keep those boundaries. I think if you're approaching your business the way you should be approaching your business. Damn it. I told you, Skip, I was going to play devil's advocate against you on this one. (laughs) <laughs> but I can't. I just can't. Right, I know, right? I was wondering. I'm like, how's he gonna do that? <laughs> well, listen. I'll, let me try at least. Ah, shit, I can't. The way you worded that, I can't, man. I can't because I, I agree. Because there are exceptions. There's always exceptions. You yeah. know that that relationship that you build with people who genuinely, I think, at least in my experience, there becomes a sincerity with the fact that you know I I've admitted. I'm like, God damn, this client. I've been training this client for a long time. He's a friend. And there's a few that may be listening to go, yeah, I think I'm in that friend. And, and there are a few because we have built, they've been in my home. They may come to vacation here or in Colorado yeah. and hang out and they're around my family. Um, you know, many clients, maybe not many. Well, I mean, you know, if I had to go off the top of my head, maybe 10 or 15 clients I've had in my home. And some of them I've had in my home repeatedly, even from other countries. So, I do consider some of them friends, but those are much, they're kind of the exception to Mm. the rule. Yeah. And that's from having that long-term rapport and getting to know each other. So the boundaries there, I don't feel are as poor as if you just have a client who you have had for two months and you're hanging out with them and, and, you know, either jumping on a yacht or cruising around or going to, you know, dinner and having drinks and things like that. I think it's just, it's asking for trouble. But again, people can, you're your own, if you're a trainer, you're your own business, and you can take advice or you can leave it. So it's entirely up to them. Yeah, I, one of the things I said. So I've had clients we have like similar interests outside of the client, you know, the training hobbies or whatever we talk about. I'm like, don't blow everybody off. But I'd say this: if you are messaging your train coach as much as your best friend, you might want to reevaluate that. Hmm. With some people, yeah. maybe some people like it, but I mean, you know, they need a break too. Yeah. yeah, real quick. Um, you, I remember I worked with Jimmy Kennedy for almost six years. He would come into town Who's during Jimmy the Kennedy? off season. He um, no bracelet guy. He, yeah, exactly. Well, for real though. He, I mean, for real though, because I mean, a lot of people might not even know who you're talking about. So I want everybody to know. Yeah, he was a defensive lineman um, in the NFL for uh, about ten, roughly uh, ten years. Ended his career with uh, the Giants with a Super Bowl ring in I want to say 2012. But if he's listening, he'd be like, you motherfucker, it's 2000. We had him on the show. It was in there somewhere. We yeah. did. Scott said the guy yeah. without the bracelet. I doubt he got the bracelet back. No, I I don't think he did. Um, I'm actually pretty sure he didn't. But anyway, I got to the point where the last two years I was working with him, uh, I told him that second to the last year that um, I couldn't take his money. Mm. He went to pay me when he got into town. I said, I can't, I just, I, I just can't take it. And it was a decent amount of money. I mean, make no mistake. It was good money. Yeah. And he kind of looked at, I said, look, really what has happened is I, we're friends. We've gotten to know each other so well. Yeah. We're hanging out and everything. I just feel it's awkward for me to be your friend. And to hang out, I'd rather do, we're going to go to the gym. We're going to pound. We're going to laugh. We're going to bang weights. We're going to go hang out and we're friends, dude. We're and it was funny because I think that that drove home for him. And this is a little different uh, situation than just an average client. Don't get me wrong. But you have to understand his position. People want to be around him, or at that time wanted to be around him, no matter how they could get around. Him. Starstruck, mm-hmm. you know, he's the NFL and everything else. And I think that really kind of solidified to him, man, this motherfucker is sincere because he's handing me back a really big check and refusing to take it. So I think that kind of drove it home for him that, wow, at least there's one person in my life who's trying not to ride my coattails and gain something from me in the meantime. So, um, you know, I think that helped our 
um, kind of solidified our, our friendship, I think. Uh, but at the same time, it just gets, that's the boundaries thing. I, I was aware of it at that time. And I think since then, I've always had that, you know, on my brain moving forward. And again, that was roughly, I mean, that would have been close to 2010, probably 2011, because I think he was out. I think his last year was 2012 hmm. with the Giants. I'm pretty sure. I now I'll say this. So I have, I, I have friends, the people that I would call friends that started out as clients and that they have still paid me for my services. Like people that I would consider to be good friends now, but here's my thought. I honestly, like if I do something for free, like it, I've had it happen to me before where I had been like, oh yeah, I'll just help you out, man. I don't really want to charge you. If it becomes that, I don't feel as much accountability, honestly. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be straight up. You know, I've been like, you know, it's like there, there's a level of like, if I'm getting paid, then I feel like, oh shit, I got to be worth my money. You know what I mean? And I've helped people out for free and I feel like I hadn't done as much of a service to them. You're not invested. Yeah, You're I feel not fully like, invested. I feel like th that there is that. Um, we just got a, a interesting point that uh, Shannon made. He said, uh, uh, just like training friends and family, there is some uh, times a loss of accountability when you become friends with your trainer. I think that that makes a good sense, man, mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of sense. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I've and had that happen the, too. Between a business relationship. You know, you can still get along. You can go to a show and hang out and do that. You can still get along and you can have fun. It's not like you can't have fun and you can't have dialogue yeah. and you can't laugh and joke. It's just, again, it just comes back to boundaries. It's knowing when, uh, you know, lines are crossed or it's too cozy, yeah. uh, you know, that sort of thing. So if I see a client's spouse or wife naked, we probably crossed a line at some point. Whoa, uh, that just came out of left field. <laughs> I what know. if they're spray tanning? Yeah, see, there are always exceptions. There's always yeah. exceptions. So next time you sleep with one of your clients' wives or girlfriends, just have a spray tan thing. Have a have a thing of protein. Have a little, have a little eureka tent in the hotel room and a little tan yeah. and a fan. I was just doing her tan. That's all, all right. I was doing. We'll get back through these questions here. Uh, Jeremy, so this ties back into the GH thing earlier. We may have kind of already answered this. Oh, uh, well, kind of, kind of not. He says, that would two units of GH be enough to help heal some nagging tendon issues? I guess we didn't answer this. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. You know, versus four. No. Versus zero. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's anything. I don't want to say anything will help, but it, but it'll help. It definitely has to help. You think, uh, would it be a go-to like, man, I got some tendon issues. I need to get on some growth. No, I think you gotta be just. GH, you got to be consistently on it. Yeah. It's just yeah. not one you just pop and take for two weeks and get off. I mean, consistency. I'll tell you, with my hip problem, I made it a point that even when I wasn't training and was, you know, threw up my hands, I was not going to stop my supplementation because that I knew that my supplementation protocol was going to continue to help to feed the recovery. Sure. And without it, now, never mind that blood levels would have remained high and they would have taken, especially because I was taking a ton of shit. Uh, but I knew I was smart enough to to know, you know, I, I don't want to back off on anything. I got to keep my recovery as high as possible right now. And growth was an absolute matter of fact. I ended up taking it every day hmm. where I don't normally do that. Yeah. Yeah, I almost feel... you change your injection site. Yeah, I wasn't going to. It's one of the reasons I didn't um, even go down the path of BPC because getting in and there was no way I was going to put an injection anywhere near. You don't have to I use was... it uh, locally. OK, it's well, systemic right away. OK, yeah. see that I that I, I'm not familiar, very familiar at all with BPC and not using it before. I mean, that's why I was asking you some pretty basic questions, Scott. I didn't know that. I actually thought that it had to be local, uh, but I knew I was not going to go anywhere near that. And with the with the hematoma, I was like, fuck, man, this thing is just so big. And then having the spasm at the hematoma site, it was just a mess. I didn't want to go anywhere near it. Yeah, so, I, I still do, like, be, because I don't know, like, I'm not 100% sure, like, well, what if it does have a local effect? So, like, with my bicep tendon stuff, I'd put it in the front delt. Does it help more? I, I don't know. But, yeah, from what I hear, it can be systemic. But, yeah, man, I, I feel like GH, that's more of like a, I wouldn't start it just to fix that. But I, I would tell you this, man, I feel like I'd be less likely to have issues while you're mm -hmm. using, you know, if you're using it, you know, especially for a guy in his forties, maybe, 
you know, 30s, 40s, I feel like, yeah, it could only, mm-hmm. could only help maybe keep you from having other injuries that are similar to that, take, too. Take it forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, should natties try to suppress H- SHBG to squeeze out every ounce of their existing free test? Then you wouldn't be a natty. Exactly. Because <laughs> the next question will be, how do I do that without drugs? Good luck with that. Boron? I didn't say I didn't call you a moron. I said boron. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the way is it boron? Is it boron though that that does something to SHBG? Proviron does. (laughs) Can you take proviron? Only proviron and remain natty? No, and then your test levels would go down. That's what I'm saying. I, I said that because that would be the next question. That's the point I was making. Okay, I think there is something to it, but I. I don't know. Yeah, there may be. I'm not aware of what that. I'm sure what that some... Okay, boron is in plasma increased significantly following uh, hours of weekly consumption. Six hour, uh, six hour supplementation showed a significant decrease in SHBG. I I want to say one of my clients actually informed me of this. I haven't tried it personally, but I think Was he might test in humans or mice. Uh, I don't know. It's a PubMed study. Let's see. Might be in animals. Um, I would have to read the abstract, but I think that, uh, I think Dante's talked about this. It's a Scott Stevenson question. In healthy men. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Boron, it looks like it's in healthy men. Yeah, it does sound like a good one for Scott, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. What about this one? Okay. Um, ooh, what are your guys' thoughts and Phil possibly making a comeback to the L. Want it, Scott? I'd rather see Mike Tyson fight Roy Jones Jr. on I his would, comeback. I would like to see Mike Tyson fight. Make no mistake, because I saw him the other day and he was moving like a he was he not is, moving like a fifty year old man. He is quicker than <laughs> my viciousness of my power is coming through my my my, 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 my palladium maximus through my arms. Gonna get him. <laughs> Mike's the man, dude. He's gonna knock him out. Killing That's him. good shit. Uh, Phil with the O, boy. I want to. I tell you what. I will say this because I am putting aside my personal issues, and I will say strictly from a physique standpoint, uh, no one will touch him. Yeah, they will be fight. They'll be fighting for second place. I think everybody. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe everybody is. Oh, you know, Brandon Curry is coming there. He's coming there to win. Yeah. You know, he and and he's got a hell of a physique, but they're, we're talking about apples and oranges. And I think, and, and this is not, Brandon, I want to reemphasize this. Brandon's physique is retardedly awesome. He looks, he, he looks incredible. But putting them next to each other, what's going to happen is they're so radically different. And the, the, Biggest difference between the two, the, 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 the most stark contrast is going to be in conditioning because Brandon is ridiculously full and Phil is going to be shredded. Huh. And Brandon doesn't now, it doesn't mean that he couldn't. What I would like to see is if the two are going to stand next to each other, that Brandon changes his game plan. And instead of coming in ridiculously full, he gets bone dry and shredded that would be fun to watch what about the arnold but, look i mean i feel like he was harder there right yeah but at the same time i still think it's apples and orange i think when the two stand next to each other phil is going now this is assuming that his midsection is is no longer an issue and everything else but the reason i say so matter of factly that he's going to just dominate this show is because i <laughs> And people close to Phil, I think, would agree with me. They may not say it publicly, but they'll understand and they'll be going, yeah, he's right when I say this. Phil's ego is too big. Mm. and He's got too much to lose. He already got beat once. If he didn't think he was going to come in and storm that stage, That's a good he point. wouldn't come back. He would not come back. That's a good I point. honestly feel his ego could not handle because if he comes back and he's beat again, it's hang up your trunks time. Well, it might be anyway, but that's a hell of a point. He win. I think he's still got it. And I, I don't think it has to do with condition or what he looks like when he comes back. Who has ever retired from bodybuilding and come back and won? 
Well, Nobody. Jay Cutler didn't retire, but he lost and came back and won. Yeah, right. I was, I was like, who's retired and come back and won? Nobody. Well, but he, I don't, I don't did think, he really retire? Did he, he retire? He, not, he didn't retire. Yeah. No, no, he didn't retire, but I said, who is, but who has left the sport completely? He didn't like, leave the sport. He took know, a year or two off because he had stomach issues. about Phil right? Heath. Yeah. yeah. He didn't retire. I don't think it has, I don't think it has anything to do with his physique. I don't think that he would be judged Mr. Olympia. You don't think he's going to win it? He could be the best one out there. I don't think he'll win it. Oh, Jesus. I think it's going to be a standalone. Okay. I think people are going to know it within. I think even all the fans and everybody else, even Brandon Curry fans. And like I said, Brandon's a great guy. He's got a great physique. All I'm saying is, it's Phil, and I, yeah. I really do think it comes down to the fact that he would not come back and risk it if he could not destroy. I don't think it has anything to do with Phil's condition, his physique, or anything. I don't think he – I think it's because of the – I think it's just the way it is. He's been out. They moved. They move him on to the next one. Let me ask you this then. So, okay, we've heard a lot. You know, a lot of people hate Phil. A lot of people have, you know, talked shit about him. But let's just look at our perspective – now, if we go by what Jimmy Kennedy said when we had him on the show a while back, he said that Phil wasn't doing great financially. You know, what would be even if he doesn't win, this would be a great move to spark some excitement around him, build finances up. He, he's got to be able to make some money going into this. Right. I mean, think about you or me, Skip. We've talked about it 100 times, dude. If you get ready for a show. Think about how the, the way that works for you as being a person that's in this industry. You make more money. Being competitive, you can make more money. You're going to get more clients. There's going to be more opportunities that come your way. Mm -hmm. If sure. he were in need of money, would his ego be too big? To I mean, because, you know, you're saying that he wouldn't step back in unless he could. What about that? What about if what about if he just really desperately needed to make the money? Would he yeah, be able to put a, his ego aside to do it then and just that's be like. That's a good point. And I considered that, um, it, and it is a very good point, but I considered that into the equation. And I think that his ego still trumps that. Yeah. And, and we don't know. First, I'll admit, I don't know whether he's got a financial problem or not. I hear things. Yeah. Um, I hear things that I think are relatively reliable. On the other hand, people have financial. Let's say he does have financial problems and he needs to compete. Does he or he feels he needs to compete? Does he have financial problems because he doesn't have enough money coming in, or does he just blow money hmm. and he's got obligations that he ha that are to you know a lot of us make enough money, but a lot of people spend too much fucking money. So the large majority of regular people probably don't necessarily need to make more money. They need to quit spending as much as they are mm. on the things that they are and, and that sort of thing. Input versus, um, you know, in what's coming in versus what's going out. So I don't know specifically what those details are. If I did, I wouldn't mention them anyway, because I guess I'd be, you know, I would, I'd be out of line. But, um, if I say had privileged information or anything, sure, like that. sure. But I would, but I would say that, his ego, in my opinion, would still he just has too much to lose on what is a, essentially a legacy hmm. that I just don't think that he would. In fact, I'm I'm so convinced of it that I say he comes in and he he does. He dominates it. And there is no question. You know him better than obviously well, S2H I or I do. The only thing that I'll say to that is this. I. I didn't. You know, I have I don't know much about the guy over the last, you know, I've been gone from Colorado for two and a half years. I probably didn't talk to him a whole lot the last couple of years that I was there because of the things that were going on and the fact that he tr maybe even three years before I left because mm -hmm. of his travel and his obligations and things like that. Yeah, I knew much more about him and spoke with him a lot. I don't say a lot, but I spoke with him enough that I knew what was going on. We had conversations, things like that prior to that. But admittedly, time has passed. Um, that's why I do try to say, look, I have my own personal issues with him. I, you know, uh, morally and, and that sort of thing. But you know what? Over time, people can change. They can understand that, hmm. that they have made some shitty decisions. They can understand that they have treated people poorly. I don't know where he is and all that. I don't know if his loss at the at the O didn't bring around oh. personal changes where he's a different person than he was before. It's I would possible, like to dude. Think that he is. Hey, listen, he, I would have to I think that love... a situation like that would have to bring some personal change, whether you, you wanted it or so. not. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, certainly he got a lesson in, in a little bit of a lesson in humility because you can see how he carries himself now versus hmm. how he did prior to that. And a little bit of it admittedly was entertaining and he was king of the hill and he can, you know, he can say those things with, with sheer confidence. No, no problem with that. But I would like to think that over time that this loss may have helped him on a personal level more than, you know, anybody will ever, ever know. And if it hasn't, then I feel sorry for him. Hmm. Hmm. I'll go on record saying I will. I would just feel sorry for the guy if he didn't get the personal growth that that he could out of the situation. I've heard some people say that it may only be an American lineup this year, meaning that the lineup wouldn't necessarily include some of the guys from overseas that could be a I'm threat. I'm sure that's a possibility with everything going on. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That could but make he was it easier. Out, just so that Scott knows, he was only out basically because of the, you know, he, it, it, so far as I understand, that it was the, you know, the surgery yeah. and getting things repaired and everything in order, and then being able to come back, uh, recover from that, and then get back into training and make the changes that he needs to make. I, I don't see it. I don't think at any point he uh, contemplated. We all did, but I don't. I don't have any reason or any indication that makes me think he was going to retire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he never said anything like so, that. Yeah, I. I think he is very capable, and I think it'll be very obvious uh, that week before Christmas. I think it's incredibly odd and coincidental that it happens to be on his birthday. But hmm. uh, you know, I don't know that that. I think it's just a, a really odd coincidence. I don't think that that the sport would care whether it was on his birthday or not. But that do you, don't you think that's an odd, kind of an odd coincidence that they pushed it and it happens to be on his birthday? It just strike, struck me as well, kind of an odd I thing. mean, they probably don't go down the list of competitors' birthdays and go, let's keep it off this one. No, but look at it this way. What if they thought, oh, we have to push it anyway. It's going to be close to Christmas to be say, oh, shit, that's Phil's birthday. I wonder if this might... Edge him, egg him out a little? Yeah. Want him there's no question the IFBB wants him to come back because sure. of the hype, because of his fan base and everything else. There's no question. Him being there will sell more tickets than him not being there. There's just no question. Yeah. So they would benefit from that. Um, whether it would be enough to, you know, make such a bias, you know, scheduling of the show is, I don't even, I don't know about that. But it's an odd coincidence, if nothing else. Okay, we got a couple more here. Um, interesting. What are the most life-changing food prep uh, kitchen tools that you have? George Foreman grill. Yeah? Meh. Nah. I used to love my George Foreman. i cook all my fish on it, just like Jay Cutler. I'd put foil on it. and Yeah, but it doesn't help those people who prep for like a whole week. No. You know no. what I mean? So, I mean, if you're doing it meal by meal, that that can life changing. <clears throat> um, geez, I don't know that about that, because I just I think I just prep my shit old school. I mean, I I cook chicken in a fucking skillet and I freeze them. What about so like that I have a you were using what's that thing called? The um, I don't have one, obviously, or I'd know the spoon. name air fryer or spoon. <laughs> I wonder, I was going to say air fryer too. And I think from a health standpoint, I think those are great, but I, I actually, spoon. I did have one and I used it twice. Really? Um, yeah, it just, they're not very big. You can't get much in them. And again, you're cooking by the meal. And I just don't think the large majority of people cook by the meal. Huh? I want to get one. So Dude, the George yeah. Foreman grill was like on fire with everybody competing. Yeah. Yeah. Came out. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And the air fryer was too. I mean, I just think that the, the large majority of people these days, I think even much more so than even 10 years ago, people prep their food longer than they used to. And I think that people, they prep it, they freeze it, or they keep it in the fridge. And you're basically just trying to get through your food prep as quickly as possible because it sucks for a couple hours every week when you have to prep all your food. Yeah. I don't cook nothing. So, so there's that. What about, uh, I like um, crock pot. You can throw your chicken. When I worked and I had to, I was like on a schedule, you could put that in there and not have to put any love into it, not have to think about it. You just wake up the next morning and your chicken's ready. Whole vat of it. I never Don't, forget, don't forget to turn it on, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
I never cooked my stuff in a crock pot because of the measurement issue. I'm so anal with measurement that I can't put things all together like that. But uh, I did for my kids. Yeah. We had a crock pot on the counter that literally didn't move for maybe five years. And I would, one of the first things I'd do when I got up in the morning was put uh, on low heat and put the kids' dinner in the crock pot. And I think that will probably be one of those. one of those things that they remember that's positive that doesn't cause PTSD for them from being a child in the Hill family. But I think they would probably remember that as one of those one of those things of growing up. Why can't you measure your food? You cook it you do you measure it raw or what do you Yeah, I always measure. Oh, I yeah. measure my food cooked. Yeah. There's there's those weirdos out there. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Skip loading the skillet up going, What are you doing? I'm skip loading my skillet. He's throwing it full of stuff. My kids don't talk like that. God damn, yeah, dude. They do. They're skip loading. No, they don't. They don't sound like that. Now you're just being a dick. You're a good dad. I pictured you at home with like an apron on, Skip, making the dinner when they were kids and stuff uh, in the morning. The only time I had an apron on was when I would make jelly. I had an apron that my buddy made. There's a picture of it. And it says Jelly Diva. Because I used to make I used to make jelly for real. I would make uh, and I would send it out for Christmas. And my clients would be like, oh, are you going to send jelly? It's your jam. I make jam. jam? Like um, jala- pineapple jalapeno. Oh, shit. Um, and then the other one was like a red pepper. Red pepper jelly. Or That's anyway, badass, man. Yeah, it was pretty. I'd mess that fucking destroy that kitchen. My wife would be so <laughs> fucking mad. Yeah. And everything is sticky, and it makes such a mess. It takes forever to clean up, but it was, it was pretty good shit. I haven't made it in about five years, and I still get people around Christmas time, friends and family, and sometimes some clients who will ask me about it. So if you need jelly or jam around the around the holidays, maybe I can get back and make a couple batches this year. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, how about this one? We've got one more here. Um, when finishing a low-carb phase to reset your insulin sensitivity, keeping calories the same would you slowly introduce carbs uh, in at each meal to see how your body responds or make switches to include carbs in every meal considering calories stay the s- considering calories stay the same we are really confused by this did that make sense to you anybody no i'm not following no. hmm Keeping calories the same. Okay, well, let's just let's just take the beginning of it. How about that? When finishing a low-carb phase to reset insulin sensitivity, what do you do? How do you how do you how do you start reintroducing carbs? Well, reintroducing increasing carbs. Right? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna. You've been on low carbs. How do you how do you start bringing carbs back in? Do you put them? Well, it's kind of a tough question because. I'm assuming that they're leaner. I mean, the leaner yeah. you get, the more insulin sensitive since insulin sensitive you are. So you would slowly introduce more carbs when you keep track of your condition and your scale weight and you know body fat levels, things like that, and and start adding carbs back in. I mean, obviously, if you start throwing in a bunch of carbs, that's going to, you know, it's not going to help with keeping your insulin sensitivity high. Um, so I'm not real sure probably more complex carbs i mean you don't eat a bunch of donuts or something yeah okay so let's say skip or scott i'm your client we've had to diet me down to increase my insulin sensitivity because i'm a fat ass basically all right and Mm -hmm. um now we're like okay you're lean enough let's start switching the gears let's start growing what's your first thought what would be a potential that you might do with me to be like all right we're gonna start shifting we're gonna add some carbs back in start growing some muscle for this guy i'd probably just add some oats in the first meal and some jasmine rice somewhere in the middle and start it slow every day or just like around training or just you you know uh it depends on the person but yeah i mean just it's like skip says it's just kind of a pyramid thing you start out a little bit and see where it goes yeah. I don't think there's like a, a general answer to that question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you do the best answer probably is you do have to start low. I mean, if you jump too quick or you jump too fast, yeah, then that that is more of a risk of of losing the sensitivity. But uh, it just depends. Again, you know, did they only diet for a couple of weeks? You know, how lean are they? 
Um, God, I hate they to They're overweight back to for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just a, how low were the carbs to begin with? I mean, you know, he used, Scott used a couple examples for types of carbs. I would say this, and this is just an example. I'm just using numbers as a, to make a point. Yeah. You know, if you went down and you were low at 75 grams of carbs on training days and, you know, 25 grams of carbs on non-training days, which is retardedly low, but anyway... You start introducing them, you know, I probably would start with training days and maybe add, you know, 40 or 50 grams of carbs on training days and go a couple weeks, see how that goes, and then add from there. But the numbers have to be small. I mean, they, those jumps have to be small so that you can, you know, your goal, if, you, if you're if you trying to increase insulin sensitivity, you don't want to change gears and then all of a sudden ruin it. Yeah. So you have to be careful, you know, coming mm-hmm. back as well. So. Yeah, fair enough. It, 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 it is. It's a tough one. I get that. I get that it's a tough question because everybody's going to be unique. Whatever it took them to get that 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 resensitized state, that's going to be unique as well. And that really kind of is the foundation for what you would do next, right? And stay lean. Yeah. I mean, the leaner you are, the more insulin sensitive you know that you'll be. So it, it comes back to that that old adage. You know, a lot of people used to do the whole bulk, and they're cool with their body fat levels being higher, and they grow better. There are a lot of people, and I think it might even actually be the majority that should grow better <laughs> if they're leaner, not ridiculously lean, yeah. but leaner than care. Because the higher your body fat levels, the more you're going to battle that insulin sensitivity. And and mm. I know I've seen it where clients will lose, you know, ten or fifteen pounds, and they're growing better, all things being equal, than when they were heavier because their insulin sensitivity is better. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, that helps to feed growth so much more than, than being more insulin resistant. I used myself as an example uh, a couple of years ago before well, it wasn't even a couple of years ago. It was the end of last year where the last few months of my off season, I was like, you know, what, I'm gonna push my weight up a little bit. It might've gone up another eight pounds. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to get stronger, you know, didn't get stronger at all. <laughs> I lost almost 20 pounds over the course of the next f- three months coming into the beginning of this year and was stronger at a lower body weight, Damn. 20 pounds less because insulin sensitivity was better. Yeah. So it's not always about, I, don't, I would even go so far as to say this when it comes to growth, it's not even as much about calories as it is about insulin sensitivity versus resistance. You got to huh. factor that in at least equal to yeah. the caloric intake. Yeah. And a lot of people will push those calories up and think, Oh, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, probably still it's if you're not progressing we I, we just said this on the last show if you're not progressing within bodybuilding rep ranges you're probably not growing yeah i, I mean it, you know that's so if you're not growing and you're taking in more calories then you need to question whether you're you know where your insulin sensitivity versus you know resistance is there uh and if the ratio is out of whack because you've got more calories you got more food and you're not growing yeah, I think you'd be real careful too if people have you know, been high about real high body fat for a long time. Maybe like they're borderline diabetic. Yeah, and they they go on the no carb type thing or very low carbs. They lose a lot of body fat. Those type of people, you got to be more, more careful when you introduce the carbs back in because you know, especially if you you know check their blood sugar when they start out. How it's you know what's going on with their body. You know. Yeah. And uh, that those people you got to be a lot careful with. You know. Small females. Small females that diet down for a contest, they tend to have to eat very few calories to get there. Not always, but a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And I feel and they like run. <laughs> and they run, huh? Mm-hmm. I feel like you got to really take your time in those situations. Yeah. Just as an example, mm-hmm. not that Jared John is in that situation, but yeah, that's it. That's all we got, guys. Okay. We had a bunch of people uh, <laughs> hang out with us Good for the live feed. We had a bunch of people hang out with us for the live feed. That was fun. Um, we're sponsored by True Nutrition. Go to truenutrition.com. Use our code ADVICES. We also are sponsored by Azoth. Go to getazoth.com. Also, we have um, the Amazon link. And, of course, check out teamskip.com for everything Skip Hill related. You can check them out for some coaching. Reach out to me. You can find me on social media, Scott McNally, one on Instagram. And S2H, go to his gun shop. And uh, don't shoot the floor. Don't shoot the floor. Yes. For another episode of Blood, Sweat, and Gear with S2H and Skip Hill, I'm Scott McNally, guys. We'll see you soon.